The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo, Book 19, Chapter 1 As I see that I have still to discuss the fit destinies of the two cities, the earthly and the heavenly, I must first explain, so far as the limits of this work allow me, the reasonings by which men have attempted to make for themselves a happiness in this unhappy life, in order that it may be evident, not only from divine authority, but also from such reasons as can be adduced to unbelievers, how the empty dreams of the philosophers differ from the hope which God gives to us, and from the substantial fulfillment of it which he will give us as our blessedness. Philosophers have expressed a great variety of diverse opinions regarding the ends of goods and of evils, and this question they have eagerly canvassed, that they might, if possible, discover what makes a man happy. For the end of our good is that for the sake of which other things are to be desired, while it is to be desired for its own sake, and the end of evil is that on account of which other things are to be shunned, while it is avoided on its own account. Thus, by the end of good, we at present mean not that by which good is destroyed, so that it no longer exists, but that by which it is finished, so that it becomes complete, and by the end of evil we mean not that which abolishes it, but that which completes its development. These two ends, therefore, are the supreme good and the supreme evil. And, as I have said, those who have in this vain life professed the study of wisdom have been at great pains to discover these ends, and to obtain the supreme good and avoid the supreme evil in this life. And although they erred in a variety of ways, yet natural insight has prevented them from wandering from the truth so far that they have not placed the supreme good and evil, some in the soul, some in the body, and some in both. From this tripartite distribution of the sects of philosophy, Marcus Varro, in his book De Philosophia, has drawn so large a variety of opinions, that by a subtle and minute analysis of distinctions, he numbers without difficulty as many as two hundred and eighty-eight sects, not that these have actually existed, but sects which are possible. To illustrate briefly what he means, I must begin with his own introductory statement in the above-mentioned book, that there are four things which men desire, as it were by nature, without a master, without the help of any instruction, without industry or the art of living which is called virtue, and which is certainly learned, either pleasure, which is an agreeable stirring of the bodily sense, or repose, which excludes every bodily inconvenience, or both these, which Epicurus calls by the one name pleasure, or the primary objects of nature, which comprehend the things already named and other things, either bodily, such as health and safety, and integrity of the members, or spiritual, such as the greater and less mental gifts that are found in men. Now these four things, pleasure, repose, the two combined, and the primary objects of nature, exist in us in such sort that we must either desire virtue on their account, or them for the sake of virtue, or both for their own sake. And consequently there arise from this distinction twelve sects, for each is by this consideration tripled. I will illustrate this in one instance, and having done so, it will not be difficult to understand the others. According, then, as bodily pleasure is subjected, preferred, or united to virtue, there are three sects. It is subjected to virtue when it is chosen as subservient to virtue. Thus it is a duty of virtue to live for one's country, and for its sake to beget children, neither of which can be done without bodily pleasure. For there is pleasure in eating and drinking, pleasure also in sexual intercourse. But when it is preferred to virtue, it is desired for its own sake, and virtue is chosen only for its sake, and to effect nothing else than the attainment or preservation of bodily pleasure. And this indeed is to make life hideous, for where virtue is the slave of pleasure, it no longer deserves the name of virtue." Yet even this disgraceful distortion has found some philosophers to patronize and defend it. Then virtue is united to pleasure when neither is desired for the other's sake, but both for their own. 
and therefore as pleasure, according as it is subjected, preferred, or united to virtue, makes three sects, so also do repose, pleasure, and repose combined, and the prime natural blessings make their three sects each. For as men's opinions vary, and these four things are sometimes subjected, sometimes preferred, and sometimes united to virtue, there are produced twelve sects. But this number again is doubled by the addition of one difference, that is, the social life. For whoever attaches himself to any of these sects does so either for his own sake alone, or for the sake of a companion, for whom he ought to wish what he desires for himself. And thus there will be twelve of those who think some one of these opinions should be held for their own sakes, and the other twelve who decide that they ought to follow this or that philosophy not for their own sakes only, but also for the sake of others whose good they desire as their own. These twenty-four sects again are doubled and become forty-eight by adding a difference taken from the new academy. For each of these four and twenty sects can hold and defend their opinion as certain, as the Stoics defended the position that the supreme good of man consisted solely in virtue, or they can be held as probable but not certain, as the new academics did. There are therefore twenty-four who hold their philosophy as certainly true, other twenty-four who hold their opinions as probable but not certain. Again, as each person who attaches himself to any of these sects may adopt the mode of life either of the cynics or of the other philosophers, this distinction will double the number and so make ninety-six sects. Then lastly, as each of these sects may be adhered to either by men who love a life of ease, as those who have through choice or necessity addicted themselves to study, or by men who love a busy life, as those who, while philosophizing, have been much occupied with state affairs and public business, or by men who choose a mixed life, in imitation of those who have apportioned their time partly to erudite leisure, partly to necessary business, by these differences the number of the sects is tripled, and becomes two hundred and eighty-eight. I have thus, as briefly and lucidly as I could, given in my own words the opinions which Varro expresses in his book. But how he refutes all the rest of these sects, and chooses one, the old academy instituted by Plato, and continuing to Polemo, the fourth teacher of that school of philosophy, which held that their system was certain, and how on this ground he distinguishes it from the new academy, which began with Polemo's successor Arcesilus, and held that all things are uncertain, and how he seeks to establish that the old academy was as free from error as from doubt, all this, I say, were too long to enter upon in detail, and yet I must not altogether pass it by in silence. Varro then rejects, as a first step, all those differences which have multiplied the number of sects, and the ground on which he does so is that they are not differences about the supreme good. He maintains that in philosophy a sect is created only by its having an opinion of its own different from other schools on the point of the ends in chief. For man has no other reason for philosophizing than that he may be happy, but that which makes him happy is itself the supreme good. In other words, the supreme good is the reason of philosophizing, and therefore that cannot be called a sect of philosophy which pursues no way of its own towards the supreme good. Thus, when it is asked whether a wise man will adopt the social life, and desire and be interested in the supreme good of his friend as in his own, or will, on the contrary, do all that he does merely for his own sake, there is no question here about the supreme good, but only about the propriety of associating or not associating a friend in its participation, whether the wise man will do this not for his own sake, but for the sake of his friend, in whose good he delights as in his own. So, too, when it is asked whether all things about which philosophy is concerned are to be considered uncertain, as by the new academy, or certain, as the other philosophers maintain, the question here is not what end should be pursued, but whether or not we are to believe in the substantial existence of that end, or, to put it more plainly, whether he who pursues the supreme good must maintain that it is a true good, or only that it appears to him to be true, though possibly it may be delusive, both pursuing one and the same good. 
The distinction, too, which is founded on the dress and manners of the cynics, does not touch the question of the chief good, but only the question whether he who pursues that good which seems to himself true should live as do the cynics. There were, in fact, men who, though they pursued different things as the supreme good, some choosing pleasure, others virtue, yet adopted that mode of life which gave the cynics their name. Thus, whatever it is which distinguishes the cynics from other philosophers, this has no bearing on the choice and pursuit of that good which constitutes happiness. For if it had any such bearing, then the same habits of life would necessitate the pursuit of the same chief good, and diverse habits would necessitate the pursuit of different ends. CHAPTER Two. The same may be said of those three kinds of life, the life of studious leisure and search after truth, the life of easy engagement in affairs, and the life in which both these are mingled. When it is asked which of these should be adopted, this involves no controversy about the end of good, but inquires which of these three puts a man in the best position for finding and retaining the supreme good. For this good, as soon as a man finds it, makes him happy. But letter leisure, or public business, or the alternation of these, do not necessarily constitute happiness. Many, in fact, find it possible to adopt one or other of these modes of life, and yet to miss what makes a man happy. The question, therefore, regarding the supreme good and the supreme evil, in which distinguishes sects of philosophy, is one, and these questions concerning the social life, the doubt of the academy, the dress and food of the cynics, the three modes of life, the active, the contemplative, and the mixed, these are different questions, into none of which the question of the chief good enters. And therefore, as Marcus Varro multiplied the sects to the number of 288, or whatever larger number he chose, by introducing these four differences derived from the social life, the new academy, the cynics, and the threefold form of life, so by removing these differences as having no bearing on the supreme good, and as therefore not constituting what can properly be called sects, he returns to those twelve schools which concern themselves with inquiring what that good is which makes makes man happy, and he shows that one of these is true, the rest false. In other words, he dismisses the distinction founded on the threefold mode of life, and so decreases the whole number by two-thirds, reducing the sects to ninety-six. Then, putting aside the cynic peculiarities, the number decreases by a half to forty-eight. Taking away next the distinction occasioned by the hesitancy of the new academy, the number is again halved and reduced to twenty-four treating in a similar way the diversity introduced by the consideration of the social life, there are left but twelve, which this difference had doubled to twenty-four. Regarding these twelve, no reason can be assigned why they should not be called sects, for in them the sole inquiry is regarding the supreme good and the ultimate evil, that is to say, regarding the supreme good, for this being found, the opposite evil is thereby found. Now to make these twelve sects, he multiplies by three these four things, pleasure, repose, pleasure and repose combined, and the primary objects of nature, which Varro calls primigenia. For as these four things are sometimes subordinated to virtue, so that they seem to be desired not for their own sake, but for virtue's sake, sometimes preferred to it, so that virtue seems to be necessary not on its own account, but in order to attain these things, sometimes joined with it, so that both they and virtue are desired for their own sakes, we must multiply the four by three, and thus we get twelve sects. But from those four things Varro eliminates three, pleasure, repose, pleasure and repose combined, not because he thinks these are not worthy of the place assigned to them, but because they are included in the primary objects of nature. And what need is there, at any rate, to make a threefold division out of these two ends, pleasure and repose, taking them first severally and then conjunctly, since both they, and many other things besides, are comprehended in the primary objects of nature? Which of the three remaining sects must be chosen? This is the question that Varro dwells upon. For whether one of these three, or some other, be chosen, reason forbids that more than one be true." 
This we shall afterwards see, but meanwhile let us explain as briefly and distinctly as we can how Varro makes his selection from these three, that is, from the sects which severally hold that the primary objects of nature are to be desired for virtue's sake, that virtue is to be desired for their sake, and that virtue and these objects are to be desired each for their own sake. CHAPTER three. Which of these three is true, and to be adopted, he attempts to show in the following manner. As it is the supreme good not of a tree, or of a beast, or of a god, but of man, that philosophy is in quest of, he thinks that, first of all, we must define man. He is of opinion that there are two parts in human nature, body and soul, and makes no doubt that of these two the soul is the better and by far the more worthy part. But whether the soul alone is the man, so that the body holds the same relation to it as a horse to the horseman, this he thinks has to be ascertained. The horseman is not a horse and a man, but only a man, yet he is called a horseman because he is in some relation to the horse. Again, is the body alone the man, having a relation to the soul such as the cup has to the drink? For it is not the cup and the drink it contains which are called the cup, but the cup alone. Yet it is so called because it is made to hold the drink. Or, lastly, is it neither the soul alone nor the body alone, but both together which are man, the body and the soul being each a part, but the whole man being both together, as we call two horses yoked together a pair, of which pair the near and the off horse is each a part, but we do not call either of them, no matter how connected with the other, a pair, but only both together. Of these three alternatives, then, Varro chooses the third, that man is neither the body alone, nor the soul alone, but both together. And therefore the highest good in which lies the happiness of man is composed of goods of both kinds, both bodily and spiritual. And consequently he thinks that the primary objects of nature are to be sought for their own sake, and that virtue, which is the art of living, and can be communicated by instruction, is the most excellent of spiritual goods. This virtue, then, or art of regulating life, when it has received these primary objects of nature, which existed independently of it, and prior to any instruction, seeks them all, and itself also, for its own sake and it uses them, as it also uses itself, that from them all it may derive profit and enjoyment, greater or less, according as they are themselves greater or less, and while it takes pleasure in all of them, it despises the less that it may obtain or retain the greater when occasion demands. Now of all goods, spiritual or bodily, there is none at all to compare with virtue. For virtue makes a good use both of itself and of all other goods in which lies man's happiness. And where it is absent, no matter how many good things a man has, they are not for his good, and consequently should not be called good things while they belong to one who makes them useless by using them badly. The life of man, then, is called happy when it enjoys virtue and these other spiritual and bodily good things without which virtue is impossible. It is called happier if it enjoys some or many other good things which are not essential to virtue, and happiest of all if it lacks not one of the good things which pertain to the body and the soul. For life is not the same thing as virtue, since not every life but a wisely regulated life is virtue, and yet, while there can be life of some kind without virtue, there cannot be virtue without life. This I might apply to memory and reason and such mental faculties, for these exist prior to instruction, and without them there cannot be any instruction, and consequently no virtue, since virtue is learned. But bodily advantages, such as swiftness of foot, beauty, or strength, are not essential to virtue, neither is virtue essential to them, and yet they are good things. And according to our philosophers, even these advantages are desired by virtue for its own sake, and are used and enjoyed by it in a becoming manner. They say that this happy life is also social, and loves the advantages of its friends as its own, and for their sake wishes for them what it desires for itself, 
whether these friends live in the same family as a wife, children, domestics, or in the locality where one's home is, as the citizens of the same town, or in the world at large as the nations bound in common human brotherhood, or in the universe itself comprehended in the heavens and the earth, as those whom they call gods, and provide as friends for the wise man, and whom we more familiarly call angels. Moreover, they say that regarding the supreme good and evil there is no room for doubt, and that they therefore differ from the new academy in this respect, and they are not concerned whether a philosopher pursues those ends which they think true in the cynic dress and manner of life, or in some other. And lastly, in regard to the three modes of life, the contemplative, the active, and the composite, they declare in favor of the third that these were the opinions and doctrines of the old academy varro asserts on the authority of antiochus cicero's master and his own though cicero makes him out to have been more frequently in accordance with the stoics than with the old academy but of what importance is this to us who ought to judge the matter on its own merits rather than to understand accurately what different men have thought about it chapter four if, then, we be asked what the city of God has to say upon these points, and, in the first place, what its opinion regarding the supreme good and evil is, it will reply that life eternal is the supreme good, death eternal the supreme evil, and that to obtain the one and escape the other we must live rightly. And thus it is written, The just lives by faith, for we do not as yet see our good, and must therefore live by faith. Neither have we in ourselves power to live rightly, but can do so only if he who has given us faith to believe in his help do help us when we believe and pray. As for those who have supposed that the sovereign good and evil are to be found in this life, and have placed it either in the soul or the body or in both, or, to speak more explicitly, either in pleasure or in virtue or in both, in repose or in virtue or in both, in pleasure and repose, or in virtue, or in all combined, in the primary objects of nature, or in virtue, or in both. All these have, with a marvellous shallowness, sought to find their blessedness in this life and in themselves. Contempt has been poured upon such ideas by the truth, saying by the prophet, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, or, as the apostle Paul cites the passage, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. For what flood of eloquence can suffice to detail the miseries of this life? Cicero, in the consolation on the death of his daughter, has spent all his ability in lamentation, but how inadequate was even his ability here? For when, where, how, in this life can these primary objects of nature be possessed so that they may not be assailed by unforeseen accidents? Is the body of the wise man exempt from any pain which may dispel pleasure, from any disquietude which may banish repose? The amputation or decay of the members of the body puts an end to its integrity. Deformity blights its beauty, weakness its health, lassitude its vigor, sleepiness or sluggishness its activity. And which of these is it that may not assail the flesh of the wise man? Comely and fitting attitudes and movements of the body are numbered among the prime natural blessings, but what if some sickness makes the members tremble? What if a man suffers from curvature of the spine to such an extent that his hands reach the ground, and he goes upon all fours like a quadruped? Does not this destroy all beauty and grace in the body, whether at rest or in motion? What shall I say of the fundamental blessings of the soul, sense, and intellect, of which the one is given for the perception, and the other for the comprehension of truth? But what kind of sense is it that remains when a man becomes deaf and blind? Where are reason and intellect when disease makes a man delirious? We can scarcely, or not at all, refrain from tears when we think of or see the actions and words of such frantic persons, and consider how different from, and even opposed to their own sober judgment and ordinary conduct, their present demeanor is. And what shall I say of those who suffer from demoniacal possession? Where is their own intelligence hidden and buried while the malignant spirit is using their body and soul according to his own will? And who is quite sure that no such thing can happen to the wise man in this life? 
Then, as to the perception of truth, what can we hope for even in this way while in the body, as we read in the true book of wisdom, the corruptible body weigheth down the soul, and the earthly tabernacle presseth down the mind that museth upon many things? And eagerness, or desire of action, if this is the right meaning to put upon the Greek horme, is also reckoned among the primary advantages of nature, and yet is it not this which produces those pitiable movements of the insane, and those actions which we shudder to see when sense is deceived and reason deranged? In fine, virtue itself, which is not among the primary objects of nature, but succeeds to them as the result of learning, though it holds the highest place among human good things, what is its occupation save to wage perpetual war with vices, not those that are outside of us, but within, not other men's, but our own, a war which is waged especially by that virtue which the Greeks call sophrosune, and we temperance, and which bridles carnal lusts and prevents them from winning the consent of the spirit to wicked deeds. For we must not fancy that there is no vice in us, when, as the apostle says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. For to this vice there is a contrary virtue, when, as the same writer says, the spirit lusteth against the flesh. For these two, he says, are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things which you would. But what is it we wish to do when we seek to attain the supreme good, unless that the flesh should cease to lust against the spirit, and that there be no vice in us against which the spirit may lust? And as we cannot attain to this in the present life, however ardently we desire it, let us by God's help accomplish at least this, to preserve the soul from succumbing and yielding to the flesh that lusts against it, and to refuse our consent to the perpetration of sin. Far be it from us, then, to fancy that while we are still engaged in this intestine war, we have already found the happiness which we seek to reach by victory. And who is there so wise that he has no conflict at all to maintain against his vices? What shall I say of that virtue which is called prudence? Is not all its vigilance spent in the discernment of good from evil things, so that no mistake may be admitted about what we should desire and what avoid? And thus it is itself a proof that we are in the midst of evils, or that evils are in us. For it teaches us that it is an evil to consent to sin, and a good to refuse this consent. And yet this evil, to which prudence teaches and temperance enables us not to consent, is removed from this life neither by prudence nor by temperance. And justice, whose office it is to render to every man his due, whereby there is in man himself a certain just order of nature, so that the soul is subjected to God, and the flesh to the soul, and consequently both soul and flesh to God, does not this virtue demonstrate that it is as yet rather laboring towards its end than resting in its finished work? For the soul is so much the less subjected to God as it is less occupied with the thought of God, and the flesh is so much the less subjected to the spirit as it lusts more vehemently against the spirit. So long, therefore, as we are beset by this weakness, this plague, this disease, how shall we dare to say that we are safe? And if not safe, then how can we be already enjoying our final beatitude? Then that virtue which goes by the name of fortitude is the plainest proof of the ills of life, for it is these ills which it is compelled to bear patiently. And this holds good no matter though the ripest wisdom coexists with it. And I am at a loss to understand how the Stoic philosophers can presume to say that these are no ills, though at the same time they allow the wise man to commit suicide, and pass out of this life if they become so grievous that he cannot or ought not to endure them. But such is the stupid pride of these men who fancy that the supreme good can be found in this life, and that they can become happy by their own resources, that their wise man, or at least the man whom they fancifully depict as such, is always happy, even though he become blind, deaf, dumb, mutilated, racked with pains, or suffer any conceivable calamity such as may compel him to make away with himself, and they are not ashamed to call the life that is beset with these evils happy. O oh, happy life which seeks the aid of death to end it! 
If it is happy, let the wise man remain in it. But if these ills drive him out of it, in what sense is it happy? Or how can they say that these are not evils which conquer the virtue of fortitude, and force it not only to yield, but so to rave, that it in one breath calls life happy, and recommends it to be given up? For who is so blind as not to see that if it were happy, it would not be fled from? And if they say we should flee from it on account of the infirmities that beset it, why then do they not lower their pride and acknowledge that it is miserable? Was it, I would ask, fortitude or weakness which prompted Cato to kill himself? For he would not have done so had he not been too weak to endure Caesar's victory. Where, then, is his fortitude? It has yielded, it has succumbed, it has been so thoroughly overcome as to abandon, forsake, flee this happy life. Or was it no longer happy? Then it was miserable. How, then, were these not evils which made life miserable, and a thing to be escaped from? And therefore those who admit that these are evils, as the peripatetics do in the old academy, the sect which Varro advocates, express a more intelligible doctrine. But theirs also is a surprising mistake, for they contend that this is a happy life which is beset by these evils, even though they be so great that he who endures them should commit suicide to escape them. Pains and anguish of body, says Varro, are evils, and so much the worse in proportion to their severity, and to escape them you must quit this life. What life, I pray? This life, he says, which is oppressed by such evils. Then it is happy in the midst of these very evils on account of which you say we must quit it? Or do you call it happy because you are at liberty to escape these evils by death? What then, if by some secret judgment of God you were held fast, and not permitted to die, nor suffered to live without these evils? In that case, at least, you would say that such a life was miserable. It is soon relinquished, no doubt, but this does not make it not miserable, for were it eternal, you yourself would pronounce it miserable. Its brevity, therefore, does not clear it of misery, neither ought it to be called happiness, because it is a brief misery. Certainly there is a mighty force in these evils which compel a man, according to them even a wise man, to cease to be a man that he may escape them, though they say, and say truly, that it is, as it were, the first and strongest demand of nature that a man cherish himself, and naturally therefore avoid death, and should so stand his own friend as to wish and vehemently aim at continuing to exist as a living creature, and subsisting in this union of soul and body. There is a mighty force in these evils to overcome this natural instinct by which death is by every means and with all a man's efforts avoided, and to overcome it so completely that what was avoided is desired, sought after, and, if it cannot in any other way be obtained, is inflicted by the man on himself. There is a mighty force in these evils which make fortitude a homicide, if indeed that is to be called fortitude which is so thoroughly overcome by these evils, that it not only cannot preserve by patience the man whom it undertook to govern and defend, but is itself obliged to kill him. The wise man, I admit, ought to bear death with patience, but when it is inflicted by another. If, then, as these men maintain, he is obliged to inflict it on himself, certainly it must be owned that the ills which compel him to this are not only evils, but intolerable evils. The life, then, which is either subject to accidents, or environed with evils so considerable and grievous, could never have been called happy, if the men who give it this name had condescended to yield to the truth, and to be conquered by valid arguments, when they inquired after the happy life, as they yield to unhappiness, and are overcome by overwhelming evils, when they put themselves to death, and if they had not fancied that the supreme good was to be found in this mortal life. For the very virtues of this life, which are certainly its best and most useful possessions, are all the more telling proofs of its miseries, in proportion, as they are helpful against the violence of its dangers, toils, and woes. For if these are true virtues, and such cannot exist save in those who have true piety, they do not profess to be able to deliver the men who possess them from all miseries. For true virtues tell no such lies, but they profess, 
convinced that by the hope of the future world this life, which is miserably involved in the many and great evils of this world, is happy, as it is also safe. For if not yet safe, how could it be happy? And therefore the Apostle Paul, speaking not of men without prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice, but of those whose lives were regulated by true piety, and whose virtues were therefore true, says, For we are saved by hope. Now hope which is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. As therefore we are saved, so we are made happy by hope. And as we do not as yet possess a present, but look for a future salvation, so is it with our happiness, and this with patience. For we are encompassed with evils which we ought patiently to endure, until we come to the ineffable enjoyment of unmixed good, for there shall be no longer anything to endure." Salvation, such as it shall be in the world to come, shall itself be our final happiness. And this happiness these philosophers refuse to believe in, because they do not see it, and attempt to fabricate for themselves a happiness in this life, based upon a virtue which is as deceitful as it is proud. End of Book 19, Chapters 1 through 4. Recording by Darren L. Slider. Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org.